What a beautiful life. All that I've got is all that I need. I got you, baby, you got me. What more could I ask for? Beautiful life. This is Lady Mo, host of the Mo Vibe Radio Show, where it's good vibes, real vibes, always leaving you one to Mo Vibes. And today, as we continue to vibe, we have the real Charlemagne from Brick City joining us today. Hello, Mr. Real Charlemagne. How are you? Hello, Lady Mo, the Mo Vibe. I'm glad I could vibe with you a little bit today. Um, like as she said, this is the real Charlemagne. My show is Brick City. You know, this is not a coincidence, you know, uh, or error. We, you're listening to both our voices again today. We got a little information to share with you. So uh, go ahead, put it out there, Mo. Uh, share your sponsorships. <laughs> Yes, as always, we are sponsored by A New You Services, located here in Greenville, North Carolina, offering life success, business, and financial coaching, which we will be talking about today, the financial coaching piece, where we transform the total you, because nobody likes to be broke. Nobody likes to be broken. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about that financial coaching, but if you would like a one-on-one session, the sponsorship is offering a 15-minute free consultation at one 771 a new you A-N-E-W-U. Call that number for your free session today. Who's your sponsor, Mr. Charlemagne? As always, that's good chocolate. Um, chocolate made with a mom's touch. And um, reach out to her at thatsgoodchocolate.com. And she was generously reach out, reach back out to you <laughs> with, that, <laughs> with that good chocolate. Um, you know, with the temperatures rising, um, some things she may not be able to ship right away or ship uh, to certain places in the country due to the temperature. But uh, like I said, just reach out to her and she would definitely um, try to find a way to get you that's good chocolate. That's good chocolate.com. All right, Mo, what you got for us today? I got to go back to that good chocolate. I must attest that I had some of that good chocolate. That good chocolate is good. Okay. Y'all have got to try the pecan truffles, I think it's called. Ta- toffee, Delicious. Toffee. That, that, <laughs> that, 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 that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. That one. <laughs> yes, try that one. Okay. So back to the shout outs. And as we proceed um, with the show, we definitely want you to download, download, download at WDRB Media our heart and tune in radio because we love it when you tune in we need to know that you're there so today as we get into our topic for today we're talking about having your house in order yes i think this is a great topic to talk about during this time where people are trying to figure out how to get money and how to keep money where to invest money and so as we get into the subject for today I want you to get out your pens and your paper because it is so important that you remember what is best and what is not best to do during this time where we definitely need to be saving money. What's your take on it, Mr. Charlemagne? Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, you know, we we definitely had a good uh a good balance in the economy per se, you know, during the COVID. A lot of people started saving and realize how much money they were spending pre COVID before COVID. Um, so during COVID time, you know, they started, you know, Hey, I'm home all the time. I'm not eating out. I'm saving money on gas, you know, things of that nature. And then they're like, Oh, wow. Now they, they feel like things are opening back up. Now they're going back to their usual spending habits. And sometimes they're probably going over, they're spending habits because they're so excited, you know, that things are opening back up. So <laughs> right. um, that's my take. And I feel like, like you said, with the structure, structuring of your budgeting of finances that you probably could assist them with, that would definitely um, be advantageous for them to reach out and get with the financial coach, even if it's not yourself, you know, um, to help them start budgeting and, you know, just looking at, things and make sure you don't overspend, you know, because you were saving things look a little bit different. So 
Um, what would you do? How would you coach a person like that? Like they just coming out of, you know, the COVID and they're like, oh man, I'm out of this thing now. I'm going to start traveling. And, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to time bound them too tight, but how would you, what would you say to someone like that? First of all, I would definitely suggest to prepare. One of the things that people didn't do, but uh, pre-COVID was have an emergency fund and or an entertainment fund. So one of the things that I definitely would put in place is having categories. I like having like a filing system. I know it's like a, a mental thing for me where I like to put things in certain order and have it organized. But definitely when it comes to your money, you can categorize it. So you could say, okay, well, um, and, and this is what I suggest even to my children. You take 100 percent. So let's say um, you're making and this is a nice round number just because it's easy to dissect. <laughs> okay. But let's say you're making a thousand dollars a week. That mm-hmm. equates to four thousand dollars a month. Right. OK, that's a nice, nice monthly income. Mm-hmm. So if I had to take percentages, I would take the top 10 percent because this is how I was raised and I would do tithes. Mm-hmm. And then from the tithes, that's giving it to God. I would do the five percent offering. From mm-hmm. that, um, you do your bills. Um, you make sure you put aside a, this certain percentage for bills. And when you're in the process of purchasing a house, people like to see you're only spending forty to fifty percent of your income towards your bills. The less, the better. So. If you only have, let's go with the number forty percent going towards your bills, mm-hmm. that puts you at fifty five percent. So that leaves you the entertainment fund, your savings and your investment. Now, you can divvy that up the best way you can or the best way you want to. But whatever percentage you decide to put towards your entertainment, whatever number you decide to put towards your savings and investments, make sure it's a number that won't choke you out. Because if you can't if you can't put your money in that category on a consistent basis, you will stop. You won't continue right. to do it consistently. So let's just pick a number and say we're going to do 20% savings. Now, that 55% takes us up to 75%. That leaves us with 25%. Now, I would not suggest putting 25% into entertainment, but we're just going to leave it like that for now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, would, I would have suggested like 15% to right investment and then more money to savings and investments. But look, okay. you know, some people right now, they're doing 50% or, or 75, <laughs> 75 entertainment <laughs> and 25 cent bills. They're like, oh, we can put that off to next month. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You'll be sitting I in mean, the dark while you in Hawaii. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> look, come back, life's gone. But anyway. <laughs> No, that is not going to work. So you definitely want to make sure your numbers are workable because right. you don't want, and it's about priority. You have to be mature about what you're prioritizing. So if you're planning a trip to Hawaii, you're planning a trip to Puerto Rico or um, in the States, you just want to travel and stay in hotels versus resorts or Airbnbs, whatever the case may be, just make sure you're putting aside that money consistently so you'll be prepared and even be prepared for emergencies while you're on that trip so making sure you have allocated the right amount of monies you pre-plan by writing out a budget for that trip before you take it so then that and then you dissect it by dividing it by the number of months that you feel comfortable being able to set aside per month that way when you go where you're going you're not stressing over how much money you have or how much you have left and how much you spent and you're able to come back home to home <laughs> you're not coming back <laughs> right. home in the dark you're not coming home with an eviction notice um so you're putting mm-hmm. things in the right place um and that way also by being organized you know where everything is going I keep all my receipts. My kids laugh at me. They be like, mom, you got so much paper. But at the end of the day, when those taxes, it's time to do those taxes. Mm-hmm. I know where my stuff is going. I know exactly. um, where the monies are supposed to go. So hey, add on to that, add on to that planning, 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 planning is definitely key because um, personally, you know, before COVID hit uh, people that know me personally, um, I'll be gone. <laughs> it was tough for me to be gone um just traveling and you know i'll be somewhere you know uh prior to covid so planning is definitely good like you know uh we just celebrated juneteenth saturday then we had father's day sunday so you probably splurged a little bit hopefully you looked out for the fathers if you didn't shame on you but um you know <laughs> 
anyway. And then the celebration of Juneteenth on Saturday. So, you know, what do you do in those instances? Um, Coach Mo, I'm going to switch over to Coach Mo now. Coach Mo, when you strain, you strain your budget a little bit, how do you recruit? How do you regroup from a strained budget when someone, like you said, like we had, we had a lot of festivities this weekend, you know, and this past weekend, and you know, you you strained your budget a little bit. How do you recoup from that? What do you suggest there, to your client? There are a few things you can do. Um, the first thing I will say, the number one thing most people do when they travel is eat out. Mm-hmm. So when you get back home. It's time to get back in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's time to get back in the kitchen and start taking the money that you would have normally eaten out with and saving it. And I guarantee you, if you take a look at your eat out budget versus um, the time that you could spend cooking something really simple, you can save a lot of money. I mean, mm-hmm. I know one time I looked at my eat out budget for one month and it was ridiculous. OK. Mm-hmm. And I said, now, what bill could I have put that towards? Um, the second thing is. Um, as far as your air, making sure you turn the AC to a point and leave it there so mm-hmm. that your light bill can be a little bit cheaper mm-hmm. because the more you fluctuate the temperature control, the more and the higher that your um, light bill will be. So you can save money that way. Mm-hmm. Also, you can save gas by if you have to go out, do everything while you're out Mm -hmm. um in like one big circle so to speak and then come on back home um and then travel in the morning and travel at night because it's cooler so Mm -hmm. your car ac doesn't have to work as hard to pull the gas while you're traveling i know they're little simple things but those Mm -hmm. little simple things add up Mm -hmm. so traveling when it's cooler saving um by going grocery shopping and then even in grocery shopping buying things that will be that can last longer than one day um right. yes you want fresh foods but if you can buy a pack of meat and get the family pack and dissect it into um uh, ziplock bags and only cook four pieces instead of seven pieces at a time right. um you can save money that way as well because the more trips to the grocery store the more money you're spending mm-hmm. so those are just little things you can do to recoup your monies and then another thing that i have found to be my best friend is I, I collect my coins. People be like, oh, you see that penny on the ground, girl, I'll be picking up change. I say dollars make sense and six make dollars. And when the dollars <laughs> don't make no sense, it don't make no sense. Okay. <laughs> so um, I collect coins. <laughs> I yeah. take the coins and I always put them in one place. So when I need them, matter of fact, I have two containers at home. One is for the pennies, pennies only. And the other one is for the silver, the silver only. But when I need it, I got it. Right, right. And so um, not taking, you know, for granted that you have coins that you can use instead of spending your dollars. Mm-hmm. So that is another thing that I would suggest as far right. as I know. We, I know we're not going into an investment, um, you know, things of that nature, but um, investing, investing in yourself and your family. Um what would you, you know, what, what type of percentage of your income would you want, would you suggest someone to invest in their family, i.e. insurance, you know, things of that nature? That would definitely go into uh, my personal opinion, into a bill. So you, Mm -hmm. you look at it in two perspectives. One, you need to have insurance in place in case of your death because or sickness. And and let me rewind to say that part. The old time life insurance was set in place so that it only buried you. Right. You Mm -hmm. die. Somebody gets your casket. Somebody, you know, pays the funeral home, things of that sort. I would not suggest to anybody when someone in their family dies to turn over their insurance policy to the funeral home. What you really need to do is have as if you can possibly have about eight to ten thousand dollars in savings along with the insurance policy so you can pay cash for the funeral because you can negotiate better Mm -hmm. when you tell the funeral home you have seven thousand dollars cash and they don't have to wait 30 days for the insurance policy to cash in you can negotiate because they'll rather have the cash 
Right. If you turn over your insurance policy and it's a ten thousand dollar policy, they're gonna spend every bit of your ten thousand dollars <laughs> because they have access to it and they know that's the only thing you have and you're dependent on it. And a lot of people are so uneducated about it. The insurance companies don't educate as well as the insurance agents don't educate as well as the funeral home doesn't have a duty to educate. Right. So they take the funds mm -hmm. and the family is sitting. And they're like, okay, we had a policy. We have nothing left over, which, in my opinion, I would have had a session with that client and said, you didn't have enough insurance mm -hmm. because your insurance is not just to pay for the funeral. When people die, there's a death tax. The bills that come to your house every month, if you die, they still keep coming. Mm -hmm. So someone is responsible for taking care of those bills until um, and, and then if you don't have a will, everything that you own goes into probate. So imagine if you have four children and you have a $300,000 house, mm -hmm. it's paid for. If your children were in the will and you had the insurance to cover the mortgage, oh, no, I'm sorry, it's paid for. So you don't have to have insurance to cover the mortgage, but I suggest you do that. Mm -hmm. If you, um, if the house is paid for, great. But you would have to have a will in order for that money to be allocated to each of those four children at $75,000 a piece. If right. not, somebody going to be mad because the <laughs> house is then going to go into probate and sit until the state decides who going to get it, which normally right. if there is no will, the state going to get it. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I have um, really, really reached out to people saying financial services, especially in our black community, we have lost um, financial literacy so much to the point that our children don't even see the value of the things that we value. So if we were to leave a house to them, they would rather sell it than mm -hmm. to keep it, not understanding the legacy that was built upon the American dream of a black person having a house. And they were like, I just rather have the money. And then the money is gone within a year because mm -hmm. they didn't understand the principles of saving and investing. At yeah. the same time, you could take that same insurance policy if you get a big enough policy, especially when you're young. The younger you are, the healthier you are, the wealthier you could become. So because your health can translate to wealth, you would definitely want to put an insurance policy in place. If I'm 22 years old and I don't have any health problems, I could get about $250,000, $300,000 policy for about $30 or $40 a month term. The benefit of having term is I can always, at a younger age, add on whole, which costs more money, but it has cash value. Hey, or, pause right there, Mo, hmm? because here's the deal. That's, that's just a nugget right there within itself because a lot of us, like I, those people my age, Still don't understand. I'm not gonna tell how old I am, but <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I don't mind. I don't mind. But people my age still don't understand the difference between life and whole life policy and a term policy. Could you break that down really quickly? Sure. I like to say it this way. So there are three policies that I advocate. You have your term, your universal. And your whole. So okay. let's just say we have a balance scale. Okay. Imagine with me the balance scale on the left side, we have the pivot in the middle, and then we have the right side. On the left side, you have term. Term is cheaper insurance and you can get more of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But usually with term, it lasts for a certain time period, either 10 years, 20 years, or 30 years. Gotcha. Then on the right side, you have whole. Mm -hmm. Whole gives you cash value, which means if I buy a hundred thousand dollar policy and I pay on it until it, it covers your whole life. Right. And I pay on it until I'm like 80 some years old. I probably can cash out 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars of that policy or I can borrow against that policy if I hit a rough time. Mm -hmm. It builds in cash value. The gotcha. younger I get it, the cheaper it is. Right. But it does cost more. Mm -hmm. In the middle is like a hybrid of term and whole. Mm -hmm. Universal gives you a whole amount. So let's say of that $100,000 I was just talking about for whole life, 
if I got that same $100,000 policy in term, I might be paying $30 a month. That same $100,000 policy in whole might be $115, depending on how old I am and mm -hmm. how good my health is. Mm -hmm. Universal will give you, let's say we take 50000 of that hundred, and then the other 50000 in term, mm -hmm. it just broke my payment down. Instead of paying $30 or $100, I might be paying like $50. Gotcha. So I usually push my clients or recommend to my clients based on their budget, the universal, mm -hmm. because they're getting the best of both worlds. Right. And I think that's beneficial to a lot of people, just the education um, of understanding where you are when it comes to insurance, because you don't want to be in a term issue when I, I know some, some people have been where it was like 15 years and then it's like, now what you know where where that money at that i just spent <laughs> you know what i mean so um you know some you know some instances that's that's definitely definitely important um let me let me interject i've had a number of clients that i just did free consultations just looking at their insurance policies of what they have mm -hmm. and almost a hundred percent of the clients i had didn't even know what they had right that was number one number right. two their stuff was about to expire. Their their policy had a certain time period that once they got to this certain age, it would go from like $40 a month to $160 a month because mm. they were aging out of the policy uh, time period that they had. I had one client that was in their 60s getting ready to retire and their insurance was getting ready to go to $700 a month. And they yeah. were like, there's no way I can afford seven hundred dollars a wow. month. If you hadn't told me, I wouldn't have known. So I was able to save them by putting them into a policy because they didn't have, you know, health issues. So I was able to save them five six hundred dollars by converting them to the policies that we offer. And another thing about the policies that we offer, again, how I was talking to you earlier about most people get them when they die. These policies that my company offers they pay while you're living. So if mm -hmm. you're diagnosed with, if you come in with good health, mm -hmm. but you are diagnosed with cancer, they pay what they call living benefits, which is something that most insurance policies, especially the traditional ones, right. do not do. Exactly. So if you was to call your policy holder right now, um, like we, we deal with um, Columbia Financial Group, um, Forrester, um, uh, uh, Mutual Omaha um, mm -hmm. and National Life Group. National Life Group, I like that one because it's more of an investment. Um, it, it develops compound interest. It's like your retirement fund right. with tax free. Uh, you can pull out without getting penalized. And so um, we, what we do is find out what your budget is and then we try to help you based on your budget right. and based on what your health is. But those living benefits are so important because a lot of people don't know that that is available to them. They think I only need insurance because I die. But what about if you become <laughs> terminally ill? What about if you get sick and you're out of work for a while? Does your right. policy cover you for disability? And then some people say, oh, I got accident insurance or I got insurance with my job. And they don't know that the policy only going to pay if it's an accident. If, exactly. <laughs> you know, and I, found, I, I found that out. It was there, was, there was the benefit of understanding the military um, certain policies wouldn't pay if you you died in combat because it's like you was in the theater of war. So therefore, you knew it's a, it's a good probability you possibly would die, you know, in, in war in the theater of war. So it was like some policies wouldn't they wouldn't they wouldn't give you coverage or like you said if if something happened to you overseas or in the theater of war they wouldn't pay out. Um, so, you know, the military had an insurance, but, you know, insurance on top of that, you would like to have. Um, but like you said, it's, it's good to know certain terms and, and disclosures when you sign, before you sign that paperwork and start giving people your money, <laughs> you know what I'm right, saying? Exactly. You don't want to get jammed up at the end. You, you know, like you said, you lose a loved one or whatever. And then you're like, well, I got such, such, such. And then they'd be like, Sorry, no, you didn't. 
<laughs> no, you didn't. And if you lie on your application and say yeah. you are not a smoker and you're a smoker, they won't pay. If right. you say, I don't have any health issues, they do what they call a medical. Uh, there's a medical insurance bureau where they can check to see the last time you've been to the doctor. Uh, right. with, your diagnoses are so if you tell stories they won't pay Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh so there Mm -hmm. are certain things that can protect you but you have to do your due diligence to protect yourself so i think the education piece is definitely um very very important yeah um so let's we got we got about five more minutes so um let's touch on wheels real quick and i know the important of having a will importance of having a will um you know, sometimes, you know, everybody just thinks that a look at it from a standpoint of, you know, be, you know, maintaining wealth in your family and, you know, your family get, gaining things. But a lot of times it's a peace of mind for your family as well, because, you know, it, it lets them grieve in peace in a sense, because they don't have to worry about, like you said, the state coming in, trying to snatch this and, you know, other people trying to say, well, Joe Blow promised me this this car before I left before he left and da 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 da. So it just give you that peace of mind. So what other aspects of a will and what what would you suggest people place in a will? How detailed should it be? Um, well, it depends on what kind of assets that person has. I just had a personal experience where I had a cousin that was promising me a house, and because we didn't have anything in writing. She passed away about a month ago and I lost all the conversation and agreements that we had because it was a a verbal agreement. So um, it is very important to be detailed. If you promise something, it's kind of like if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. So um, even if you was to write it down and get it notarized and file it at the courthouse, it could be that simple. But you would want to have something uh, typed up um it reviewed and I do that I help people with that process I actually help the client not only with their will but with their last wishes like mm-hmm. um who to call if they die who to call mm-hmm. you know what child should be responsible for making the decisions because maybe I have four but I know the other three don't care this mm-hmm. one will make sure that you know my wish are carried out um and it's not it's not to be offensive but it's to be responsible and that person knows that accountability is upon them because like i said people will be mad at each other and 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 it makes the grieving process a little bit easier when it's organized and i hate to say it like that Mm -hmm. but when it's chaotic and there is no organization there is nothing in writing there, uh, nobody knows my computer passwords yeah. to be able to get in. Nobody knows my bank accounts. Nobody knows yeah. my bill account numbers. Um, and I don't have any of my children on my bank account. So everything is frozen. Nothing can move unless right. it comes directly out of their pocket. Somebody going to be mad. Like I said right. before. <laughs> yeah. So, like, like I put in my will, y'all just burn my phone, burn my computer, just throw everything in. Just burn it. That's in my. That's the first thing in my will. No, I'm just no, 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 no. <laughs> cannot happen. <laughs> it might just be a million just dollars. Burn my computer, in burn my phone. <laughs> just throw it. Just that's the first thing in my will. But hey, <laughs> I, I appreciate linking up with you again. Um, as always, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate you allowing me into your space and you in my space and and um sharing this vibe with other people in the city <laughs> in the Brick yes town. no yeah. problem get, go ahead and um you could go ahead and close out with your people because i'm out you could go ahead and close out with your people because i'm i'm done i'm dropping the mic <laughs> oh wow oh. well as always i totally enjoy being um up here we want to say thank you to wdrb media i heart and tune in radio where it's double the inspiration and the information. Come back next Saturday at 6.30 a.m. and 12 o'clock noon. I'm 6.30, the mobile radio show. And The Real Charlemagne is at 12 noon. Tune in where you, you're always going to get good vibes, real vibes, and we're going to leave you wanting more vibes. Till next time. Peace out. Does it do it?
easy. Push up on a cutie and let her squeeze me. Relax a little. Let your body work. Heavy days and effects. And I'm cool. Burn. I like to 